Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be here with you this evening. And I, I say this evening because we got in very early this morning. And that's the reason for Brother Buster's remark a while ago. When he got the day turned around. Because he's had a tough night. He came in with me at 4 o'clock this morning. So did Dr. Pettit. It was because the train was late for no other reason. In coming to you tonight, I know that some of you have come around with some misgivings about what I'm about to say, and you, some of you have taken the courage to warn me not to dip too low. Uh, I'm not going to dip, I'm going to scoop. I'm going to tell a few things that perhaps you've never heard. But it's that I want you to know that I'm going to talk to you from the standpoint of a chaplain. It is my business there to be a chaplain on this particular job. And I want to say right here and now that any pastor, any Christian pastor, would have done as well, if not a great deal better. Because of the many blunders I made, I ask my God forgiveness even again tonight. And yours too, for that matter. You know, in, in coming into this thing as a chaplain, I ought to give you uh, just a little story or two ahead of it because uh, I had quite a problem on my hands. It was one of those evenings while I was with the, the St. Louis City Mission, uh, one of those evenings when I came in late, and that, that's never good in my house, coming home late. And that night I came home a little later and I wanted to tell Mrs. Garrity about what I'd been thinking uh, about concerning joining the chaplain's corps. Well, when I got upstairs that evening, oh, brother, I could feel the atmosphere cool off on me. And I, but that never happens in uh, this part of the world, I'm sure not. We've got a lot of dry air out here, so it wouldn't happen here. But I could tell it. I didn't know whether to just knock before I came into my own house or not. I, I really didn't. But we got into the kitchen there. She sat at the table and finally, without a word, she goes to the stove and brings back the victuals, as we might say in army language, and puts them on the table in front of me. She keeps at her little job, whatever it was. Well, for a little while, I heard myself eating. I picked up enough courage to say, Do you know something, brown eyes? I always say that when I want to butter up the situation a little bit. I got to get this off to you first because uh, after a while it gets awfully serious and I, I got to get acquainted with you. But this is a true story. As you looked up at me for a moment, not a word out of her. I'd ask her again and again about joining the chaplain's corps, but finally I stopped her. I said, I asked you something. She said, I heard you the first time. You have to know her to appreciate that great big brown eyes that pin me to the wall every time she looks at me. Of course, with that, I'm the most hand checked preacher in the Missouri Senate, too. You don't believe that, well. She said, listen, I want to tell you something and make it pretty clear to you that if the Army has come to such straits that men of your age have to join the chaplain's store, I feel sorry for the Army. Oh, what a chill that gave me. Some encouragement. You, you good women know how to hand it out. I'll tell you that. Well, to make a very long story short, I was on my way into the chaplain's corps and I took the little special training we had and then assigned to the general hospital, which you heard about a moment ago. But as I moved along, I became very conscious of the fact that there was a big job to be done and I was trying to do it. And somehow I got the idea that Everybody in the army would come to church simply because I said went on. And I'm just sorry we don't have more young men in the chaplain's corps. And I ask you to think about it if you fit into that age group somewhere. Oh, by the way, I didn't ask anyone here how much time I have tonight, and I ought to tell you that that's bad in my case. It really is. 
Reminds me of a program we had in city missions in St. Louis known as Moments of Comfort. I was very definitely tied up with it, trying to be the narrator and all these things that go with it. And little girls from the slum missions did the singing, little Loretta. Some of you who were at the seminary probably remember her. She had a voice that had a way of penetrating into the hearts of people. Well, I announced on Saturday noon that she'd sing the next Sunday evening in the Good Shepherd Chapel. Well, that night I had a crowd. At least that one time, I had a crowd. I looked around a little while, and I saw that people were looking up, the, presumably wanting to hear a message, but they came to hear her sing. So if I took advantage of that, I always do. I said, this is the first time I really have occasion to preach one of the longest sermons I've ever prepared. And I dug into my coat pocket and took the one out on all the apostles. All of them. I believe there were 12, you know. And I kept going and it got later and later all the time. And that's in a slum settlement area, by the way, on 10th and Cass in St. Louis. Some of you know it. I'll be caught there after dark. And here they were sitting and every once in a while somebody would pop off of a chair and it wasn't because he was sleepy. Something else was working on him. I began a little to get worried, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I, I know, I know I'm long-winded tonight, but I hope you let me finish, and if you don't, what in the world will I do with Peter? Way in the back, a fellow gets up, he says he can have my chair, I'm going home. <laughs> There's a young man here tonight that warned me tonight if he has to get up and leave. I know why. Well, <laughs> it's all right. For the 98th gentleman, General, we went out across the way into England, and there we had the privilege of serving the men as hospital chaplains will serve them to the best of our ability. And I'll never forget many of the wonderful letters that had to be sent home. I look them over once in a while. They keep me very humble, deeply humble. And finally, after three weeks of work done, we set up housekeeping in the Schwabinger Krankenhaus in Munich, Germany, München to the Germans. And it was there that I had a chance to look around just a little while. I took a trip to Berchtesgaden to see Hitler's old nest there in the house in which he once lived. A little farther down to the left, there was over Ammergau where they have the passion play. I thought a very cute little thing happened there. There was Frau Lange, the wife of the one-time Christus player of the Oberammergau of play. She had a little shop and the statuary and so forth there that's predominantly Catholic there, and they were doing business with statues and so forth. Well, there was one little thing there I liked very much. And I tried my best German on Frau Lange. I tried to explain to her that's the thing I'd like to take along. Very charming lady. She moved up to me when she saw I was stuck on the terminology and I couldn't get the thing out right. She put her hand on my arm and she says, Chaplain, why do you torture yourself with the German? Why don't you talk English? She spoke better English than I did German and I found that out in a hurry. After that, I found out the other way around, too. If they could talk English, I didn't try my German on them. Nevertheless, I came up on it at home, and I wasn't too ashamed of it. Honestly, I wasn't. But there was Garmisch Partenkirch, and some of you XGIs were down there, and uh, you had a lot of fun there. By the way, how many XGIs are here tonight? Let me see your hands, will you? Look at that. Look at that. Uh, women, too. Oh, I didn't see any there. Thank you, that's mighty fine. Well, Garmisch Partenkirchen is still the playground of the D.I.s. Then over on the other side, we have Cheney Stay and Salzburg and places like that. But that wasn't the last. I got word that I was to go to Nuremberg, Nuremberg to the Germans to be the, the chaplain to the high Nazis on trial. I didn't like it. And I want to tell you that there was a terrific struggle going on inside of me to get, get rid of it. I'm a little ashamed of that tonight again. I told this story so often, but I do apologize every time. Because to me, you see, having visited Dachau and having met some of the men who were in charge of the concentration camp, and also having my own family split up on this thing over in Germany, through the grandparents at least, I, I could feel both sides of it. My three sons were over there with me. 
ready to give their all. The oldest one was torn to pick the Bremer half, and the second one caught in the ball. With some of you who are here tonight, I'm sure. The third one just coming in. And added to all of this, I have met a woman whom they call later on the Bitch of Belgium. I just couldn't see myself going to Nuremberg and there to talk to these men who had cooked up this whole thing as I saw it and to tell them now I know all the dirty work that went on, of all the killings that went on, even those outside of the war itself. But I want to tell you a story about another death for the forgiveness and the satisfaction of your sins before God Almighty. I just couldn't see myself doing it for the moment. And I was very much disturbed about it, and I wondered what I could do. And I went into Colonel Sullivan, the commanding officer of the 90th General Hospital, and I, I came in as any griping soldier would. And he was quite delighted at that. It's the first time he'd ever had a chaplain come in to gripe about something. Well, you XDI here tonight, you know what a good gripe can do. It either get you something or get you into trouble. Well, I started in on this, and Colonel Sullivan said, Well, Chaplain, I'm surprised at you. He says, why don't you try to get out of this thing and go home? Well, that was wonderful music to my ears, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. I said, well, Colonel, that's fine. How will I go about it? Well, he said, you might try the old age clause, and that insulted me. I'm touchy on that point anyhow. The older you get, the worse it gets, brother. At any rate, I'm on my way, and it took a little GI. A little GI, a little corporal, to put me straight. He says, Chappie, I've often heard you say that God loves the sinner, but he hates his sin. That settled it. I went on my way. And there I meet the new commanding officer of the security detachment in Nuremberg. And by the way, gentlemen, with apologies to any commanders who are here tonight, or commandants, as you might call them, I just don't like the idea of meeting new commanding officers. I heard this man right behind room 28, and he was giving some little soldier a good chewing. That's a nice word to you tonight. That's really cleaned up, that one is, I want to tell you. <laughs> and the things he said I'd never heard since I left the team of mules in southeast Missouri many years ago. Typical Army Colonel. Typical because the exceptions are the other ones, the nice ones. All of a sudden the door flies open and I'm standing there and he said, Well, after looking me up and down a few times and right through me, he says, It's about time you get here. I sure need a chaplain. And I thought, Oh Lord, you sure do, but I didn't tell him so. We're still on the little light side of this thing, and I'll, you know when I begin dipping into the heavy stuff. And so he said, now, I, I want to tell you something, Chaplain. Uh, had a little trouble with my name. You almost have to spell it out and double dot the E's and everything else for them. But he got it straight after a while, and he said, I want to tell you something. I went to Sunday school once. I didn't believe that at all. The stuff I had just heard didn't fit that. But he told me he did, and he remembered a story, and I thought that was pretty nice of him. He remembered a story uh, that someone had lost a little lamb or a sheep, and that they went out looking for it until they should find it. And he said, Chaplain Garricky downstairs, you've got some lost sheep to find. And if God is merciful with you, you might be able to bring a few of them back. He said, downstairs, you'll meet another chaplain who is to assist you. Downstairs I met a very delightful blue-eyed fellow, about 44, by the name of O'Connor, Chaplain O'Connor. There were six or seven in the army, and so this was Sixtus O'Connor, who's upstate New York. A delightful fellow, if ever you met one. I moved along with him down the line, and I said, Chappie, where did you get a hold of all of the German you got to use in this job? He had been there a day or two ahead of me. He said, well, I, I attended the University of Munich and then at Heidelberg. My mother was with me, and we lived with the German family. And I got it that way most of the time, but then in high school, too. And you never heard Chaplain O'Connor say, the coup had even defense could jump or something like that. No, sir. He knew what he was talking about. We say that down in southeast Missouri. What a good quatch that was, wasn't it? 
Uh, I move around a little, by, a little ways downstairs, and we get into the office of the guard's room, and there the fellows are all clustered around. They're on two hours, and they're off two hours of guard duty there. The captain of the guard said, well, it's sure nice to meet the prison chaplain, but any, did anybody ever tell you how you happened to become prison chaplain? Well, that was a new one to me. I hadn't thought of that. And I'll leave it to a GI to figure it out. Oh, they're cute about that. The captain says, well, it's like this. We've been talking about you. It, it works out something like this. There are 21 high Nazis on trial. Six of them are members of the Catholic Church, and Captain O'Connor will look after them, while 15 of them claim membership in your church. So we figured out that you're prison chaplain because you've got more sinners in this jail than Captain O'Connor has. I had about enough of that. Just about enough of that. But it wasn't to quit yet. We agreed. Chaplain O'Connor said, well, you go on about your business here, and I'll go on about mine. We'll see each other's men, and then we'll have our social visits to cross the line, if that's agreeable and it was. And I want to say to his credit, we got along fine, and perhaps he'd say the same about me, but we did. We knew just where we were, what we were doing, what it was all about. And uh, I tried to show that in the Saturday Evening Post article, which appeared September a year ago. Now we get to work. And little by little, I may dip just a little for a delightful moment or two, but I just want you to know that the thing's become very serious. I'm to look after these men, at least the 15 of them I should try, to see whether at all possible I can win one to the Lord's side. And so, as I try to pattern this thing now, I'd like to have you, if you will, follow me, that down on this side we have a group of them, and down on this side in the prison, and before every door, there's a guard at work, just looking on and watching. And I agreed now to get busy. I'm going to meet some of these men. I'm in the first, the very first cell to my right, coming out of the officer's room. I noticed that the name card said Rudolf Hess. Rudy to the Germans. Unser Rudy, if you please. And that's right. That's how they call it. Now, I took one look at him through that little peak hole in the door, and I lost a little nerve for the moment, a great big six-footer, about two and a half inches added to that. Finally, I got enough courage to ask the guard to let me in. And there he stood, just that tall, and he looked right over top of me. I think I'm about 5'7". That always deflates me, something like that does, and I lose my words. Nobody believes that, but I do. I asked him then and invited him whether he wouldn't take the invitation to come to the evening services on Sunday at 5.30, the Vespers. He straightened up and clicked his heels and he shot this answer across my head. He said, Chaplain, if I've got any praying to do, I'll do it right here in my cell. I'll not have to come upstairs to pray to your God. Oh, brother. I began to think of what Colonel Sullivan said. Why don't you get out under the old age clause? I really felt low. So awfully low. I walked up and down the hallway a little ways, and I came back two or three times to take a look at that next door. And there was the name Hellman Geary. I had seen Unter Hellman, as the Germans called him, in the movies, I'd seen him all tugged out in his uniform and bespeckled with medals and so forth, but I'd never met him personally. This should be my first introduction. As I move in a little closer, one of the guards gets a little funny. They were all ribbing me, having a lot of fun out of me. And I went up to the door and the guard said, you want to see Herman now? Yes, let me in, but don't push. <laughs> then everybody had to come by and see how I was getting along after I got in there. But the right marshal, and that's the way I could get his attention, that's when he would listen. He sat very calmly for a moment or two as he asked questions, and then agreed that it was a wonderful thing that the United States Army thought enough of their spiritual welfare to send them chaplains. Then he began asking what Herr Hess said about coming to chapel. When I told him, he said, that's too bad. I'm going to promise you something. I wondered what that might be. But he said, 
on the afternoon walk that we have, and they've called it the Spazier Gang out on the long side of the building, we're going to talk this thing over, and I'm going to get Herr Hess to come to chapel. Well, I didn't believe that. But that's what happened. I mean, he tried, and that afternoon he coaxed and tried and tried to persuade this man to come to chapel, and Mr. Hess said nothing to him. And all the while, Mr. Gehring said, listen, you're number one, Nazi, and I'm number two. Or turn it around. Since Unzo Führer is dead. But remember that if we had we should be seen in chapel, that something good might be said about us. Hess says, I have no intention of changing my mind. And that settles that. The next day, Mr. Gehring apologized for having failed to get Rudolf Hess to come to chapel. Well, Mr. Gehring was there at every service except a few times while he was sick. But I don't want that to fool you, not for one little bit. At least he had a start. Mr. Ribbentrop in the next cell, who was the former ambassador to England, and said, I'm going to be there. He spoke English. I want you to know that I think a great deal of the fact that there's a chaplain to see me. I have a lot of things to tell you that weigh on my heart and soul. Then he said, by the way, it was Frau Ribbentrop that got us out of the church. And my two little boys have never been baptized. They were then about five and seven. And he said, I wonder if you'd talk to her about that. He said it was Frau Ribbentrop who said you couldn't be a good Christian and a good citizen at the same time. And I said, Herr Ribbentrop, Mr. Ribbentrop, you probably mean that you can't be a good Nazi and a good Christian at the same time. Well, he said, that does sound more like it. And he smiled about it. And he said, how can you be a good Christian and a good, and a good citizen? Then I talked to him about how it works over here. We have Romans 13 and so on and so writer and whatever it might be. And then he said, yes, I guess you got something. But he came back again and again, be sure to see my wife about getting those two boys baptized. He promised to come to chapel. That afternoon, uh, Frau Ribbons was coming down the hallway and she spied me in uniform and lapels, the crosses, and she said, I believe you're the chaplain that visited my husband this morning. Is that right? Uh, yes, ma'am. She spoke English. Well, she says, I want to put something straight to you. I warned my husband not to listen to you. I warned him not to give you any of his time and that you're just fooling away your time in talking to him. I'm sure that he's not going to listen to you or any one of the other chaplains. Well, then she got a little raw about it and she shifted gears into the German and, oh, brother, did I get it then. She knew how to say it then. I went right back down to Mr. Ribbentrop and I told him the deal is off. Oh, he says, you met my wife. Well, I don't want to be too flippant with this, but I think that's the only family in Germany where I was sure the woman was the boss in the house. Of course, it won't take you ten minutes to figure out who's boss in my house. It's all right, I love it. He was in chapel regularly and did a pretty fine job of finding his savior a little later on. But in the next cell, I meet a most interesting fellow, a soldier from head to foot, Felt Marshal Keitel. As I come into his cell, he's reading a book. And when I want to know what it is, he passes it on to me, and I discover it to be his weather-beaten, thumb-worn Bible. And I wasn't prepared, ladies and gentlemen, to meet any Nazi with a Bible in his hand. I asked him what he thought of it, and there he brought out some of the most wonderful convictions of faith I ever heard in all my life. He said as he spoke the book, I've carried this book through both world wars, and I'll carry it to my death if I'm lucky. And I know from this book that God can love a sinner like me. I know that Jesus died for me. I've never been a good Christian, he said. And when he said it, I wondered how many good Christians I know. I really don't know any good Christians, honestly I don't. The only goodness we've got to boast of is the goodness of Jesus Christ in his cloak of righteousness that we have by faith in his atonement and his meritorious work. That's all the goodness we have, whether we're in America or in Central Europe. Mr. Kaiser said, I've talked to him, I've prayed for forgiveness of my sins, and I know that his blood has washed away my sin. And then he said, Chaplain, he always said, Chaplain, Kaplan, I wish you'd wait a moment while I move over and have my daily devotion. That was more than I expected, but as I listened, that man on his knees read from this Bible, 
Then he folded his hands and he began to pray, looking heavenward. And he prayed God for mercy, never for justice, always for mercy. And he sank into my heart to such degree that I got over to long sight of him. And in a moment, he was praying the Lord's Prayer, the Vater Unser, and I was praying it with him, after which he pronounced what I might call a benediction. I left Mr. Keitel with a conviction that I had met a Christian, a very weak one maybe, a very poor one, but I had met one who knew the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that'll make you a Christian in any land. I was very happy about having met him, and I said so upstairs, and the press wanted to pull me apart for it. Called me all kinds of names. Went to the commanding officer, they had me sent home. But I was getting too chummy with the Nazi because I knelt and prayed with him and for him. He was there, services regularly. Now a few of the others down on this side yet. There's Gross Admiral Rader, Admiral Rader who was head of the German Navy. He was reading one of Dr. Stickart's commentaries on Philippians, I believe it was. And he said, I've been reading up on something here I want you to help me with. He spoke English. And he said, I'll be in chapel, but I want you to talk to my colleague, Admiral Dennis. Dennis, you know, took over seven or eight days after Hitler's death. Or should I say, supposed death. Mr. Dennis said, as I came in to see him, he said, I'll be there. But you've got to show me that you can preach without bringing in politics. Well, that was a new slant on this thing. I said, well, I'll sure try. Furthermore, I don't know anything about your politics and you're not interested in mine. Let's leave it at that and talk about the mercies of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He said, that's it, and I'll be there. And I'm glad to say that he kept right on coming. I thank God for that tonight. And by the way, may I diverge just a moment. Once Chaplain O'Connor and I are some six or eight feet under the sod, and that day will come, There'll be nobody in the world to tell this story. He tells it from his point of view and his work with his men, and I tell it from mine with the work of my men that I had there. This story will never be told again by first hand, by those who were there, because they don't know it as we know it. And we only dip in so close, we never quite divulge the things that some people have been critical of. No, sir. I want to tell you, too, that I've got a stack of letters at home given to me by those men, men who went to their death, stating and requesting that if anything I could do out of their life, even as simple as it was, they'd come back to the arms of a loving Savior, I should do it because they wouldn't have time to do many good things anymore. I moved down a little farther. There are several Catholic men there, and Captain O'Connor is working with them. There is Dr. von Neurath, who said, I've been brought up in your church, and I'm coming back now. He was 70 years old, 69, and he became 70 while we were there. I got him the biggest stogie I could find in Nuremberg and brought it to him, and when he put the match on that one, my, oh my, the aroma went all the way up through the building, and everybody wanted to know what was on fire. I stayed right there and sat alongside of him on his cot until he smoked about half of it. I think that's about all he could stand. That was his birthday celebration. But in the next cell, we have a man uh, by the name of Mr. Salker. Fritz Salker was in charge of all the laboring groups being brought into uh, Germany from the occupied territories of that day. Mr. Salker was under orders from Hitler. He was under orders from Himmler. He was under orders from Goebbels. He was under orders from Gehry. He didn't know which way to turn once in a while except to do the dirty work that these men wanted him to do. And it was an international crime, there's no doubt about it. He transported human beings from one country to the other. Some with consent and some without. He was guilty of that, there's no doubt about it. Mr. Salker was walking the pacing the floor of his cell and he said, Chaplain Garricky, I'm glad you've come. I heard you were coming. I've been coming to chapel whenever I could, but I want to start in, really start in, and I want you to show me how I can qualify for the Lord's table. I've been a little frightened at that. You know how we feel about that. And I wondered whether the man knew the Lord Jesus at all, as I thought he ought to know him. And he says, I was baptized and confirmed in the Lutheran Church, and I want to know what it's all about again. Won't you re-instruct me? 
And that's exactly what happened. After months and months of instruction again and again, when Mr. Salko stood in the courtroom upstairs and said his, his catechism, his catechismus, ever saw what he was doing. And that became a testimony to what some of the others did a little later. And one day, one Sunday evening after service, Mr. Salko said, I know now what you mean. And I bring you, I bring God a broken and a contrite heart. Won't you be down to see me? I went down to see him. That night, Mr. Salker was at his bed praying as I moved over to the end of the cell to prepare the communion table. Oh, it touched my heart so very much to hear him pray. And he did pour out his heart. And he got up off of his knees and he threw his hands heavenward and he cried out with a loud voice, God, I am a zinder grenade. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I think he met every word of it. And he called on his knees over to that communion table, which every chaplain has, by the Armed Services Commission, you know. And there he knelt. Just he and I were there. No, God was there. The guards were looking on from the outside. He partook of the Lord's Supper just as you and I partake of it in our church. He came back as a penitent believer and took a hold of the hands, a nail-torn, bleeding hand of a Savior who died for him to start all over. Oh, I know, flippantly we say, it's kind of late, wasn't it, Mr. Salko? But you know, there's a story of the thief on the cross, too. Mr. Salko was the first communicant to come back, the first one to make his peace with God anew, as it were. That evening out, in Megaldorf, where we had our officers' quarters, I tried to tell about it. And as I did, every officer around the table got up and walked out. Down at the end of the table was a little shave tail. Oh, pardon me, that second lieutenant to you, citizen. Fine-looking fella, too. He came up along by me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he says, Jeffy, don't feel bad about those fellas walking out. Uh, they wanted these men shot the first morning. He looked at me a moment, he says, I'm sticking by you for a while at least. I'm sure glad he stopped. He had more Freulein troubles than you could shake a stick at. He had to see a chaplain every other day. <clears throat> Coming back to the boys. In the next cell is Mr. Rosenberg. He was the smart aleck of the crowd, and I mean that. He was just too smart to live. He wrote the 20th century myth. He has compiled in that book something that I wouldn't want my children to read. Nevertheless, he looked at me when I handed him a devotional book with an unduck grief line. He said, oh no, uh, not for me. Hands it back. Uh, how about a New Testament? No, no, no. Bitter. And he hands it back. He said, don't bother. No, thank you. Don't bother with me. Finally, he said, if my colleagues are naive enough to accept the sort of thing that you're going to give us around here, you go see them, but don't spend any time with me. A hard-hardened sinner, if ever you met one. He said, by the way, that he was Gottloibe, that he believed in a God, but he didn't have any use for a Savior. The same as Hess. They put it pretty much the same way. Believe me, it isn't for nothing, I said. I want to talk about men in high places who forgot Christ. I left him. And in the end cell, Mr. Speer. Speer, the builder and architect for Hitler, who defied Hitler's orders to blow up the bridges and the ammunition factories as they went through, and was almost killed for it, said, I'll be there. I want you to talk to my other colleagues. Across the way is Hans Fritzsche at the other end, who was the propaganda minister under Goebbels in the radio voice. Hans said, of course I'm going to be there. My heart is bothering me a lot, and I've got a bad conscience about the things I did. I want to talk to you more about this thing. And he said it to other men, too. And then there was Waldo von Schirach, the Hitler youth leader. Many of you have read about him. He was about 39, the finest looking one in the bunch. His mother is American born of Chestnut Hills, Pennsylvania. He had four lovely children and a very charming wife. And von Schirach said, I'll be there, but I'm just going there because I want to hear what you're going to do with some of the gospel lessons, and maybe sometime we'll talk about some of the things that are a little closer to my heart. Well, there you are. Walter von Schirach 
told me then in the, later on that he had led millions of young people away from the churches and he got them and mind you remember this and this is for my brethren uh, brethren of the cloth especially he said I got them out of the churches because the pastors the preachers did not talk hard enough to keep them they didn't work as hard to keep them as I worked to get them and I had a better program to offer he said and so they lost them and for you who are laymen in the Christian church, remember that these were at least nominally laymen of the church yanking the young people out of the church. That's what it amounted to. Those three men came to chapel religiously, I would say, because little by little they began to take a different interest and attitude. And these are all patterns of behavior. There were moments of tension that was now that were now going down and down. They began to feel a certain rapport among us as we visited with them. And they began to talk and unload their heartaches as any man has those heartaches. And then they heard about Mr. Salko's communion service. And as I'm instructing these young men, little by little they come to the conviction that maybe God has something that they've all forgotten. Father von Schirach, having led millions of young people away from the churches, now began to see that that little house had fallen down on him and he had nothing to go to. And so they began to talk about perhaps, perhaps the word of God does have something. Perhaps there is something in the great deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and we've only called him a man. And they were especially instructed and after due instruction and examination we went up in our little chapel. And there was one of the sweetest little services I ever had a part in. Ladies and gentlemen, there they sat. The guard got up and walked out and said, this is holy business. You won't need us. But they stood at the door. And then the three men moved forward alongside of that little communion table. Not an altar, just a table. There they knelt on that hard slab stone. A lieutenant colonel of the SS Polizei of Berlin was at the organ doing beautiful background melodies in the old chorale. And they partook of the Lord's Supper. Downstairs after this over, Mr. Gering wanted to know what was going on. I told him, he said, I'll choke Baldur von Schirach to death for having divorced himself from the promises he made to Adolf Hitler. They put another guard to work. Now four of them have come back, and I'm feeling, should I say, pretty good? In deepest humility, thanking God now that I believe four of these men had made their peace again with God and now had come back all the way. Down the line we have Dr. Frick who made the Nuremberg Laws against the Jews. Dr. Frick would see one of those men die than rather than to help him. But that's not all. Against his own people he had such a rotten heart that was hard as stone and bricks and iron because he instituted the law in Germany that a commission could pass upon the fitness of a mentally sick person to live and if that commission said he ought to die by the next morning he had gone to sleep never to awake again and then what did they do i saw where they got them a whole room full of what i thought was chat was human ground up bones they put them in a little box they tie a ribbon around it and on there unser hans and they send that to the boy's mother as a token remains that was Dr. Frick. He said, I'll be in chapel, but don't ask me anything else. Dr. Funk had pretty much the same thing to say about it. He was right bunk president. And then Dr. Schacht, whom you've read about recently again. Dr. Schacht made a smart remark that I couldn't appreciate. He said, I'll be there, but don't ever expect me to come to the Lord's table. Well, he had what my grandmother used to say, a piece of frackite in that thing, that I just didn't appreciate. It was sharpness plus. I asked him, why, Doctor, why is you sharp about this thing? He spoke English. Well, he said, it's like this. This is as close as I'm coming to the thing. He said, and I quote, if there's any degree of fairness in this trial, I'm going to be a free man when it's all over with. And I'm going to attend the Lord's Supper at the hands of Dr. Nater with my family. That almost happened just that way. He did go to the St. Lorenz Kirche in Nuremberg and there he partook of the Lord's Supper with his wife at the hands of Dr. Nater. Incidentally, Dr. Nater was a full colonel chaplain in the German Wehrmacht. Well, now, the times are flying and I've got to get to the other end of the story. 
There we have this to talk about. We have been working with these men day and night, up until the lights would flicker at nine o'clock, trying to win some of them for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, Mr. Ribbentrop asked me how to have real peace with God. And oh, what a pleasure it was to tell him about it, with all my failings, with all my blunders, to tell him about the outstretched arms of a loving, dying, bleeding Savior. And he, on his knees, took communion in his cell. Mr. Keitel came all the way back and finally said he could throw off all bitterness and listen to the Word of God. I thought he was a Christian when I found him. I think he was, but a very weak one. But now he could do it. And he came back as a communicant member. Admiral Rader came all the way back. And so out of the 13, 15 Protestants, 13 attended services, out of the 13, seven, seven became communicant members of the church again. Go on and on and I work with these men. Now, the judges are about to go into secret session for the verdict. And O'Connor and I write a letter to Justice Lawrence, the president of the tribunal, asking permission for the women folks and the children to come to see these men before the verdict should fall on their necks. It was granted, and my office was loaded down with those relatives and people. Right in front of me was Frau Schock with her two little girls. They were about three and five. I, we called them the Katsunyama kids. They were the liveliest little gals I ever saw. We said, of course, that we had some chocolate bars in the desk, and they didn't waste any time pulling the desk apart for fun. Well, that's a child, but they knew some prayers. That's what I was interested in, some prayers. Did they know Jesus? And they did. Just a little ahead was my friend, Frau Ribbentrop, with her two boys. I came close in. I felt sorry for those little fellows. She said, you can talk with them, but they're not going to speak with you. I left her. And I want to tell you a little ahead of my story that before their daddy died, those boys were brought to baptismal grace by one of the pastors over there. Off to the right, right is Frau Rosenberg with her little girl, a very pretty little blonde, about 13 or 14. I came in close and she'd heard me asking about prayer and about how does Jesus get into your heart and so forth. She turned on me and she said, don't you start with me on that prayer business. And that was a piece of fright height I didn't understand either. I wasn't going to be outdone in the field of chivalry. And so I said, let's forget about it. Is there something else I can do for you? I'd like to do you a favor of some kind. She looked at her mother and back at me and she smiled and she said, oh yes, you got a few cigarettes? I didn't have any. In the corner I was Gisela Fritchie with her mother. She said, with tears, and she was crying aloud, she says, I know that my father, my father, has made his communion with you in the church, that he's now a member of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray every night that I too can be a member of that church. I said, Gisela, you are a member now if you believe that Jesus is your Savior. Oh, I do with all my heart. Her mother had taught her the way to heaven. And off to the left was Frau Gary. I want to tell you, my friends, don't sell Frau Gehring short. A very charming lady, and I'm acquainted with all the trips that Herman Gehring went, uh, made to uh, Paris to buy clothing for her, but I know a few other things, too. Bless she gave me some wonderful treatment there with her little girl. I asked her whether I might talk to little Edda, e -D -D -A, at Edda, nine years old. Yes. I moved over to the side of the uh, room with her and I asked her about her prayers. Uh, how do you feel about Jesus, Edda? She told me. And I was convinced that that little girl knew her Savior, that she would surely go to heaven if she kept that faith. And I took one glance at her mother and she was weeping a little because then I learned that her mother had taught her that way. Her father didn't have time. She says, I pray every night that God might do something for my daddy. I said, Edda, tell me, just how do you go about, go about this thing? And she spoke German all the time. Well, she says, I kneel at my bed, I fold my hands, and I look heavenward. And I ask God to open my daddy's heart and let Jesus in. I never heard it like that in all my life. Never. In all my travels, that little girl was a Christian, praying for her daddy that she might meet him in heaven. 
The guards come rushing in and they say, Chaplain, if you want to be up there, you better hurry because there's a seat reserved for you up there and someone will take it if you don't get there. The verdict's to be read. And in the courtroom upstairs, I heard them read the verdict. Eleven of the men are to hang while several get live, 20 years, 15 and 10. And Dr. Schacht, Hans Fritzsche and Fun Poppin go free. Well, that's good enough for me. Now we have these men who are to face death in death row. I can't tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how my heart aches. My heart aches because some of these men were going to their death, refusing the outstretched arms of Jesus. What are you going to say to a man who refuses Jesus and you know he's going to die within 15 days? What would you say to him? I had tried for almost a year. I had read scripture passages. I had given them Undaf's Creed line and everything else to show them here is God's word. This isn't Garrick's word talking to you. This is Almighty God's word, the Holy Spirit. Won't you let him in? No. That last night I'm talking with Mr. Gehring in his cell. And I show him through his own Bible, Thus saith the Lord. And in that one half hour, he denied the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He denied that Jesus was anything but just a great teacher. He also denied the, the power of prayer. He denied that any man could forgive sins. He denied that the Bible was the divine inspired word of God. And he said the apostles wrote the New Testament just to make money. And so on down the line, he kept casting reflections and making sport of the scriptures until I had to tell him that was about enough. I said, if you don't trust Jesus, I've just given him to you now. If you don't trust Jesus, you cannot blame me on judgment day when you're on the other side of the gulf and say, I never told you. He said then, how do you celebrate the Lord's Supper? I've been afraid of that. Frightfully afraid of it, if there's such a thing. Then I had to tell him that only those who come with penitent hearts, with believing hearts, believe in him who instituted that supper. Now that's good in anybody's church, isn't it? Believe in him who instituted that supper. And we have a few more things added to that. I asked him about that, he said, no. No, no, I, I can't believe in him. He's not true God and true man with me. And he refused him, completely so. Mr. Gehring looked at me and he said, he's never been refused the Lord's Supper by a German pastor, never. And it has a lot to do right there with the attitude of the church of the state. I told Mr. Gehring that if he didn't believe in Jesus now, this was the last time I could talk with him. And he said, your Jesus is just another smart Jew. Mr. Gary, your little girl's been praying that you, that she might meet you in heaven. And she does it with tears in her eyes. And he cried as he said, I think my little girl believes in your Savior, but I'll take my chances my own way. I ask you with a heavy heart tonight, what would you say to a man like that? I still have a little guilt feeling about the whole business. But I brought him the word of God, I assure you that. You Christians, and I'm not after labels now when I say that, but you Christians of anybody's church, if you're Christian, just remember I tried with the word of God, and therein lies the power, I believe. But he refused it. I left him, only to be rushed back into his cell about 10.30, and the little guard said, Gehring is having a spell, won't you get in there? I was with him alone as I had his head lying in my left arm. I put my right hand over his right ear and I said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all our sins. And he trembled and he gurgled into death while lying there in my left hand. The empty cartridge shell was lying on his chest in which the poison was hidden, potassium cyanide. We don't know where he got it. I was just about unnerved, and I say that in deep humility and with utmost candor. At one o'clock, it was agreed that now we would walk out at one o'clock with Mr. Ribbentrop instead of Mr. Gehring, of course. Our 
trip to the gallows was down through the hallway, out through the yard, into the execution chamber. And there were three scaffolds. We were, I was to go to number one with this, my man. Chaplain O'Connor stood by and it was agreed that he would stand in my place just in case something should happen to my heart. We both felt pretty weak, but just stand there as respect. Mr. Ribbentrop had a final word and I'm standing on the trapdoor with him and as he turns to me, we pray a prayer we had agreed upon, after which they pulled the hood and adjusted the rope and dropped him through at my feet. We came out with Mr. Keitel, another one of mine. Standing on the trapdoor with him, we had a final word and then prayed a prayer that he and I had learned at our mother's knees many years ago. Prayed it aloud that everybody could hear it. And then he turned to me to say something that I think everyone here tonight should remember. Because it's the touch of the grace of God. He said, I thank you and those who sent you. Any one of you here tonight whose pastors prayed for worldwide missions and the special missions and so forth, you were in that thank you. God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. You've got to be born again. They dropped him through at my feet. Back and forth we went and then Mr. Rosenberg walked in and since he was catalogued in my department, I walked with him for the sake of his little girl mainly. I didn't want her to say that I had failed her there. And as I stood with him, he wouldn't pray with me and he turned to the Texas hangman and he said, get this over with in a hurry. Mr. Keitel, or Mr. Stryker came in Chaplain O'Connor walked with him, but as he stood at the foot of the stairs, going up 13 steps to the scaffold platform, as he stood there, he hollered out real loud, Heil Hitler. He stood on the platform. The chaplain tried to pray for him, and he just wouldn't work. He wouldn't listen. But then he saw 32 men sitting, now standing where they had been sitting, as witnesses of his coming death, and he spied four Russian officers in that crowd, and he yelled out with a loud voice, the Bolsheviks will hang the rest of your necks. That's a matter of record, by the way. And he was dropped through. Incidentally, his wife is a member of our church working in an Altenheim in Germany. We go back to our cells, and while we're back there, we're going to back once more for the final act in this drama. While we're now lying in our cells on our cots thinking about many things, we were voluntary prisoners there for nearly a week. Just to be ready to find a man, to catch him at the right moment that God's light of heaven might come in. There I'm lying and thinking about many things, and I want to point out some examples of findings for example, this one thing of the whole business of the complete separation of church and state. They don't know what it is over there yet. But here were pastors who were supported by the state, many of them who didn't believe what they were talking about. There were exceptions, that's right. Thank God for those. But remember that even to this day, there are small groups like the Lutherans, the Baptist Presbyterians, and some Methodist groups, small groups, that refuse, refuse the state aid, but they've all got to pay the church tax, just the same. It's an unfair business, if ever you saw it. Isn't that a reminder for some of us over here to remember that we're living in a glorious country with all of its failings, whatever they may be, it's still a grand country of religious freedom that we can worship in our churches, call them what you will. We can worship anywhere we like and the way we like, provided we don't hurt somebody else in the way we worship. We can call our pastors. We can ask for them. And we come to our churches and we have offerings to support our work, don't we? 
Not collections. Anybody can have a collection. That implies the scraps. But an offering, an honest to God offering of giving God something, and you've been doing that, I know you have, but you can do it with the freedom of religious thinking that nobody from high level command in the Pentagon bending will come to you and say, oh, nothing doing here, you can't support this cause in this and that way. Remember, we've got it now. We want to keep it that way. Thank God tonight that we have freedom of religion in our great country and ask him to help us keep it right there. Number two, I remember that Hans Fritzsche, the propaganda minister, said that the press was muzzled in 37, but it was really muzzled in 39, and you couldn't put anything into it but what was given the okay from above, and the truth was never said again. It may sound flippant to you, but it seems to me it's a pretty great country where the press has the freedom to write its story as it wants to write the facts of what they find. Let's remember that in a free America and keep it that way. There's something else. Have you ever stopped to think, you people who are a little above the young people's age, the great opportunities we've missed with some of our young people in the work of the church in our land? Balder von Schirach gave the best of his years. At 17, he joined the Hitler Youth. At 19, he became one of its leaders. And at 26, he became president of the Hitler schools to indoctrinate the Hitler Youth in the program. That's what he did, and later on apologized on the witness stand for having led millions of them away from the churches to follow a crazy man, he said. And he asked them to go back to the altars of their confirmation that they might follow a divine pattern in the person of Jesus Christ. Our young people deserve all the things we can do for them and with them toward the right development in their business of being good citizens and good Christians at the same time. I remember in my kidhood days, the only time we heard from the elders of the church was when we broke a window, and that wasn't nice. Yes, sir. Oh, we get all fired up then, don't we? Well, why can't we get fired up for the good of these young folks that want us to take a little interest in what they're doing, and they're ready to listen to the guidance? Oh, Lord. Young people, we do love you. Sometimes we don't act like it, but we do. And we want you to be citizens, Christian citizens of our great country and help us along. In Boston Commons, I heard, even in my day way back there in the fall of 43, I heard the commies talking in Boston Commons, commons and urging our young people to take up on their side and overthrow the system we have. In New York City, I have reports from people who live there, what's going on in their city parks, that men are holding lectures there to win the young people away from the democratic ideals of our country. The church better work overtime, and a lot of overtime. If we don't want to miss the boat, then doing what we can for the greatest group of people in the world, our young people.